about uh, music and uh, Shakespeare's Twelfth Night uh, with the concept of the music of the spheres. Uh, and see how it impacts uh, his play. The untuning of the sky. The untuning of the sky, I'm reading. To retune the sky. I don't know how I can retune it. Uh, and then it fell out. Uh, Actually, the song that Fusty sings him is ex highly extravagant, almost par 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 parodic version of the theme of death from unrequited love. It, it's rather stilted diction and uneasy prosody are no doubt intended to suggest a song from an old miscellany. Quote, come away is a banal beginning appearing at the start of four Song text in Canon Fellows Collection. We may also presume that the setting employed was rather more archaic than that of the well polished lute accompaniments of the turn of the century. It is just one of these, quote, light airs and recollected terms, unquote, however, with which Sir Toby and Festi plague Fovolio in their big scene of carousal. This is about. The guy's going out and partying all night and uh, carousal. Setting of, a setting of, quote, farewell, de dear heart, appears in Jane Robert Jones's first er book of errors, published in 1600. Of the other songs in the same scenes, see, I should be looking at the songs used in these plays. Of the other songs in the same scene, one is a catch, a more trivial form of song, certainly with respect to its text, than the sophisticated and intricate lewdness of the post-restoration round. The other is a love song, sung by Festian, preferred by Sir Toby and Sir Andrew, to, quote, a song of good life, uh, unquote, perhaps with a pious text. It is of the finest type of Shakespearean song uh, that catches up the spirit of overall themes and individual characters, ironically and prophetically pointing to the end of a plot or a bit of action of the, quote, O oh, mistress mine, unquote, is one in one sense an invocation to Olivia to put off her self-indulgent grief, according of her dead brother's memory. In particular, the first stanza refers to Vo Viola, the girl, the boy girl, true love, quote, that can sing both high and low, unquote. Festy song to Fovelio in his madman's prison are both of an archaic cast. The first is a snatch of a song of Wyatt's, quote, a robin, jolly robin, that was set to music by William Cornish during the reign of Henry the Eighth, And the other one, a parting jib at Fovelio's count about the devil, suggests the doggerel of an old morality involving Malfolio as the devil himself and continuing the game of mocking him by appealing to his own rhetoric. All of these occurrences of practical music function in the part as well as in the respect to the general theme of feasting and revels, the one reference to musica speculativa. Music uh, spectra, this is what we're talking about, is a very interesting one, however, and leads to the most important aspect of the operation of music in Twelfth Night. We're talking about music in Twelfth Night. Shakespeare. Olivia is exalting Valiola, Viola, to refrain from mentioning the Duke to her, implying that she would rather be courted by his messenger. So she's referring to something about the music of the sphere. She quote from the play. Viola says, dear, this is from Twelfth Night. Mm -hmm. I bod you never speak of him again, but would you undertake another suit? I had rather hear you to solicit that than music from the spheres. <laughs> I bade you never speak of him again, but would you rather undertake another suit? I had rather hear you to solicit that than music from the spheres. Mm -hmm. You see, they take another suit. Mm -hmm. It's like when the master calls the master doesn't mm -hmm. come back. He bought him a new suit. Yeah. Why? Like take another. Uh, uh, yeah. Somehow another man in a way. 
Yeah. They had it from then, back then, eh? I don't know. Could be from poetry. The citation of the music of the spheres. Uh, the citation of the music of the spheres here has the tone of most such references during the later 17th century in England with the exception of poets like Milton and Marville, who used metaphors from the old cosmology for poetic purposes of their own. The music of the spheres came in cavalier and Augustian poetry, a formal compliment to uh, her, empty of even the metaphorical import that the world view of the centuries had given to it. Just as the word heavenly, used in exclamations of praise long ago, became divorced from its substantive root, the music of the spheres, he's saying the word heavenly has been divorced from its substantive yeah, root. The, the music of the spheres. How did it get divorced? I mean, uh, they talk about it often. You're not supposed to talk about the... Not like that. Not for uh, common yeah. things, you know, when... You're not supposed to say heavenly without saying the music. Without uh, really relate mm. to it. Uh, How can it be heavenly and not be musical? Well, I would think it would have to be. Yeah. Hmm. Gradually came to designate the acme of effective charm in a performer. It was often employed in compliments to ladies, uh, for example, whose skill at singing made the sphere sound. Hmm. <sighs> Dissonant, abashed, and singing angels, and so forth, as in the case of Dryden's music, that would untune the sky. Referencing references to the heavenly harmony have had nothing to do with received ideas of music's importance during the later 17th century, which were more and more becoming confined to a rhetorical ability to elicit passion on the one hand and to provide ornament to the cognitive import of a text on the other. <laughs> we're reading about Music. <laughs> Remember Purcell, the um, the Renaissance musician? Purcell likens music and poetry to beauty and wit. Now, music, according to Purcell, is beauty and poetry is wit. Uh -huh. Respectively, the former can unite to produce the same Wondrous effects in song that the latter can in a human being, although the virtues of each are independent, the difference between music and poetry also tended to cluster about the celebrated rift between thought and feeling. Most important of all, traditional musica speculata tiva. This is what we're talking about. Gradually ceased being a model of universal order, and was replaced by a notion of music as a model of rhetorica, whose importance lay in its ability to move the passions, rather than its older role of the microscopic copy of universal harmony. It's funny, the old role was to be a microscopic copy of universal harmony. That's what human being is, is not? Musica humana. Well, this is a copy of um, Universal Harmony. Hmm. We are a microscopic copy of Universal Harmony. Hmm. The Apollonian lute harp wire constellation. Once an emblem of reason and order became an instrument of passion in the hands of Caravaggio, leering boys, and in the hands of Crashaw's musician who drew the nightingale by musically ravishing her, as even her avatar Philomena was never ravished to death. 
With these considerations in mind, the crucial role of viola as an instrument of such a rhetorical music becomes quite clear. It is unfortunate that we have no praise, precise indication of the earlier version of the play, presumably rewritten when the superior singer Robert Armin entered Shakespeare's company in which some of the songs may have been assigned to viola. She describes herself at the onset. Poem, play quote from Twelfth Night. I'll serve this duke. Thou shalt present me as a eunuch to him. It may be worth thy pains, for I can sing and speak to him in many sorts of music. That will allow me very worth his service. <laughs> she will be the duke's instrument, although she turns out to be an instrument that turns in his hand, charming both Olivia and himself in an unexpected fashion, where Sino is given an excess music of music in viola. As Cesario, she wins Olivia for her alter ego, Sebastian. The latter is himself in his few scenes, rhetorically effective, almost to the point of pre preciosity in his lycond. Hmm. To the musician Arian who charmed his way to safety, Viola represents effective instrumental, prematurely broke music in Twelfth Night. Hmm. Baroque music. Hmm. And it is she whose charm kills off the gormandizing sentimentality of both Orsino and Olivia, dis directing their appetites t of love outward, in fact, towards herself. Among the characters to whom Fovelio refers to as the lighter people, it is Festi, the singer and prankster, whose pipe and toba serve as a travesty of a Viola's vocal cords. The operation of Viola's music involves charming by the use of appearances, the effects of the trickery instigated by Festi. Ah. I have to skip ahead. Hmm. The context of the play's anti-Puritan, anti-Josorian treatment of moral physiology, the role of music, seems to have become inexorably defined for Shakespeare. For in the framework of what, at this point, it might be almost clear to call a study in musica humana, about human music, practical music, becomes justified in itself, free of even the scraps of traditional musical uh, ideology that's been put to the use in the place preceding a twelfth night represents a high point in one phrase of Shakespeare's musical dramaturgy. Then it says, it is not until Anthony and Cleopatra and the last romances that the use of an almost supernatural music, perhaps, has been suggested, imported to some degree from the musical Donis of the Mass comes to be associated with the late great themes of reconciliation and transformation. We are reading uh, from Shakespeare, The Twelfth Night. Uh, we had looked at uh, his use of the music of the spheres. Mm -hmm. What was the last song you read about the conciliation and transformation? Mm -hmm. Oh. It's the ending thing about the later yeah, play. Of, the later play is talking about Anthony and Cleopatra. You open the page. Like, open the page. Mm. It's right here. Mm -hmm. Okay, we're ending there. With um, oh, we give the way to find retune the sky. There is a way to do it. Mm. Mm. Through yoga.